Well, welcome to our third night on the parametric chapter, and uh, we're going to kind of tap the brakes tonight. We're going to study motion along a straight line, and basically this is, um, consider this one-dimensional movement. Um, we're on a, on a flat horizontal line, could be the x-axis, could be the y-axis, uh, one or the other, but basically... Um, we have some kind of particle, and he he doesn't necessarily have to start at the origin. He may start to the right of the origin. He may start to the left of the origin. And that's uh, that could be either or. But what he's going to do is he he could travel to the right, travel to the left, travel back to the right, stop, continue to the right. You know. But basically, we have two options. It's either left or right when you're traveling on a horizontal line. So it's not very exciting. But what we have to do tonight is we have to master the concepts of this um, motion along a line in one dimensional space before we can graduate tomorrow night and, and have a discussion about motion along a two dimensional plane such as the uh, coordinate uh, x, y axis. And that's where the parametrics really become exciting. So as far as our three closely related concepts today, the first function is x of t and that is called your position function. It's actually not a very useful function other than the sense that it tells you the current location of a particle. You know, if I evaluated x of 2, all it does is tell me the current location of the particle at the moment when t equals 2. Nothing more than that. Now, his derivative is gets a little more exciting. That leads you to the velocity function, okay? And then uh, position's second derivative a.k.a. the first derivative of velocity, leads you to the acceleration function. And those are where a lot of the work gets done. And um, interestingly enough, and I think this will make a ton of sense once we say it, the AP's favorite function is by far velocity. And the reason is, is because the AP can give you the velocity function and then test you on your ability to differentiate that function by asking you a question about acceleration, or they could test you on your ability to integrate by asking you a question about position. So um, just taking this relationship here and, and flipping it around, if I said the integral of acceleration that would be the velocity function plus some constant. Now remember, anytime you have an indefinite integral with no bounds, we've got to have that constant. In fact, we're going to call it c sub 1. And then if we integrated that velocity function there with respect to t, we would get the position function plus c sub 1 t plus c sub 2. Again, having the, those constants because it's indefinite. Okay, we're going to cover some popular phrases here. Um, they, they love the word initially, and basically the, many, many times they'll say the particle initially does this or that. All they're trying to say is that at the moment when t equals zero. That's all they're trying to say whenever they use the word initially. Um, our second one here, at the origin, all they're trying to say is that your current position is zero. All right. Not now. That doesn't mean he um, is back where he started because he didn't have to necessarily start at the origin. He's just currently at the origin. Now, also instead of x of t, once in a while they'll use the notation s of t. I forgot to mention that on the previous slide. Um, our third one at rest. Uh, just like you're driving, you know, you're driving a car down the road. You pull up to a stop sign. Uh, your car should should come to a rest, and at that moment your velocity is zero. Okay, And then if you change directions, basically that means velocity is going to change signs. Okay, Because uh, basically if velocity is positive, you are traveling to the right. And if velocity is negative, you're traveling to the left. So in order to change directions, velocity has to change signs. Key note there. When they want to know when the particle changed directions, setting velocity equal to zero by itself is not good enough. We've actually got to make the sign chart to confirm that velocity actually changed signs in order to change directions. Now the first fundamental theorem can really be our best friend if we know how to manipulate it and uh, make it work to, to our advantage. But uh, the one thing we've always written on our quizzes is that if you integrate, if you have a definite integral from A to B of some little f of x dx, then his antiderivative is capital F and you're going to evaluate at the upper bound and then the lower bound. And we're doing really, really well on our bite-sized quizzes at getting that first fundamental theorem down. Now the trick is how do I tweak it and apply it to these functions here today? 
Um, for instance, if I wanted to integrate, um, let's say, acceleration, um, and that would be dt at the end. And in fact, um, I want to change these bounds. Instead of from a to b, I want to use t sub 1 as the lower bound and maybe t sub 2 as the upper bound. The antiderivative of acceleration is velocity evaluated at t sub 2 minus the velocity at t sub 1. So there's one way to use it. Um, very similarly speaking, what if my bounds were t sub 1 to t sub 2 and I had to integrate the velocity function? Now the antiderivative would be position at t sub 2 minus the position at t sub 1. And so that's what we want to do here for a moment here is just kind of practice using those two creatures. Um, let's see, uh, real quick example number one. What if they told you that uh, the velocity, and they're going to go out of their way to make it really ugly, what, maybe velocity is the natural log of the uh, secant of t. You know, something very obnoxious that we would never think about integrating on our own. And maybe they also told you that the position at t equals 2 was equal to 5, and then they ask you, hey, what's the position at t equals 4? Okay, and there's our question mark. Uh, solving this one by hand is rather impossible, if not annoying at least. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that the integral from, and probably creating the bounds is, is sometimes the most difficult part, but just take what they've given you and what they, they're asking for, and those two values will always tell you what your bounds are. So I'm going to integrate from 2 to 4. I'm going to integrate that velocity function, all right, and I'm going to say that's really equal to x of 4 minus x of 2. Now the good news is, is we already know that x of 2 is a 5, so I could substitute a 5 into here and then be, um, just add it to the other side. So I'm going to say 5 plus the integral from 2 to 4 of the natural log of secant equals x of 4. And here's the great news. Now we can grab our calculator and literally plug this entire expression in. Anytime you have a definite integral like we have here, the calculator can take take over and, and crunch the whole thing out. Um, and then typing that function in, we don't obviously we don't have a special secant button. We'd have to type in natural log of 1 divided by cosine and so forth. Um, similarly speaking, um, you never know when they might uh, throw acceleration. Maybe they defined acceleration as being the, um, the arc tangent of e to the t. Again, something obnoxious. They're going out of their way to make ugly. We can certainly derive it, but integrating it's a whole different ballgame. Now, here's what if they told me that the velocity at t equals 6 was equal to 10, and then they asked, hey, what's the velocity at t equals 3? Um, my bounds, as I go to set this up and I integrate acceleration, how are you going to write your bounds? Okay, I'm going to suggest, take um, even though they're asking for the 3, 3 is the smaller number, so put it on the bottom, and then 6 is the bigger number, we'll put it on top. We'll say that's equal to the velocity at 6 minus the velocity at 3. And then we could, uh, we know v of 6 is a 10, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little rearranging. I'm going to add v of 3 to the left, and while I do that, I'm going to substitute the 10 and then subtract the integral over to the other side. And now again, because it's a definite integral, calculator can take over, and I'm just going to plug that entire expression into my calculator. Just put a big emphasis on the fact that make sure you see why it's a minus and not a plus. Well, one of the more interesting concepts we study is, is speed. And speed is very similar to velocity, but they're not the same thing. They're not completely synonymous and interchangeable. We're going to define, we're going to say that speed is the magnitude of velocity. Whoops. Let's see if I can spell this. It's the magnitude of velocity. And what does that mean? Basically, mathematically, means it's the absolute value of the velocity function. Okay, um, so basically speed will never be negative. It's not a signed function like velocity is. And uh, the AP doesn't waste their time asking you what the speed is at a certain moment because that's too easy. What they will do is they'll ask you whether the speed's increasing or decreasing. We've touched on this concept once already, but I just want to go over it one more time. This is where we stack those sign charts on top of each other. And we said speed will be increasing if velocity and acceleration share the same sign, aka they're both positive at the same time or they're both negative at the same time, which is kind of a brain teaser, but truly if they both are negative, the speed is increasing. And then as far as decreasing goes, if velocity and acceleration have different signs or opposite signs, 
then the speed is now decreasing. So that's where we would stack those sign charts on top of each other. Maybe we had, um, we'll say from zero to infinity, maybe we have critical points of two and five maybe. Here's our velocity function. And maybe he starts off positive, then he turns around, goes to the left, and then he turns around and goes back to the right. Meanwhile, we could make the same sign chart, maybe for acceleration, maybe he has a critical point at four. And we would say he's negative, and then maybe he's positive. Okay, if you generated these two sign charts, when is the speed of this particular particle increasing? Well, I would say he's increasing from, we'll say from 2 to 4, because both functions are negative, and then I would say from 5 union 5 to infinity because now both functions are positive. So those are the two intervals when he's increasing. And then how about decreasing? Just the opposite, right? Um, I would say from 0 to 2 because the signs are opposite or different. And then that little interval from 4 to 5. Don't forget about that little interval, again, because the signs are opposite. And that's all we would have to say. The other interesting, they might give us um, a visual image of the velocity function. Let's say they drew a curve that maybe looks like this. And again, this is a picture of velocity. And they're going to say, OK, um, here's point A, here's point B randomly, here's point C, and maybe here's point D. Um, let's analyze each one of these points and ask ourselves whether the speed is increasing or decreasing. So at point A, well, you know just by reading the graph that velocity is positive. So I would say uh, velocity is positive. And then as far as acceleration goes, that would be the slope of that tangent line. And so I would say acceleration is also positive. Therefore, the speed is increasing at that moment. Now at point B, again, point B, again, is above the x-axis. So velocity itself is positive. However, his tangent line is negative, or the slope is negative anyway. And because those are different signs, we'd say the speed's decreasing. Um, let's see, how about the other points? Here at C, I'm saying the velocity is negative, and I would also say that the slope of the tangent line is negative, so at that moment, speed's increasing. And then over here at D, I would say the velocity is negative because it's below the x-axis, but this time I would say acceleration's positive, and therefore uh, the speed is decreasing because they have different signs. Okay, our last topic uh, for today's lesson is comparing total distance traveled versus displacement on the particle over a uh, finite interval. And we've created this velocity graph here. And what I want to do is I want to name the regions. Well, this is region M, this is region N, and we'll call this region P. And we could tell you that the region of, or area of region M is 5, the area of N is 6, and the area of P is 8. Not quite drawn to scale, but uh, well, my drawing skills aren't the greatest, but we'll say n is supposed to be a little bigger than m. Now, those are the actual areas, and when you use the word area, you're, you're always having a positive outcome. However, uh, let's call the roots, we'll say, okay, the graph starts at zero, and we'll call that root a, we'll call this root b, and we'll call this root c. If I integrated from a to b, or no, no, I'm sorry, integrate from zero to a of velocity, what we're going to get is we're going to get an area, a net area of 5, and all it does is it tells us that the particle traveled a total of 5 units to the right. That's what it's telling us, traveled 5 total units to the right. Now, if we integrate that same function now from A to B, this is the interesting one. Now, we said the area of N was 6, but the integral describes the net area. So the integral would actually give you negative 6. And what that now means is the particle turned around at point A and then traveled 6 units back to the left. Okay, And then the integral from B to C of velocity, the particle again stopped at point B. He turned around and he now traveled a grand total of 8 units to the right. So we did 5 units to the right, 6 units to the left, and then 8 units to the right. Now, um, let's see if we get a little trickier here. What if I wanted to do the integral starting at zero all the way to C of velocity by itself? Okay, now we're taking into account we did five units to the right, then back six units, so our uh, displacement's now negative one, and then eight units to the right, so we now have a displacement of seven. So, and all that is is that's measuring your displacement, it's taking into account that you did some traveling in both directions, okay, and 
and I don't know, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Let's see, now the integral from zero to c of the absolute value of velocity now. Now what we're doing is we're forcing the entire graph to be positive. And in fact, if we go look at this graph, we would delete this chunk right here, and we would reflect it over the x-axis, and we'd say region n is now up here. So now all of those values are positive, and we would get a grand total area of, let's see, 5 plus 6 is 11, plus 8 is 19. That describes my total distance traveled. All right. I think it, very, it helps a lot to visualize it graphically. And just to generalize the two different formulas, if they want displacement, that's going to be the integral from t sub 1 to t sub 2 of, uh, sometimes we call it naked velocity because it doesn't have the absolute values on it. And then the total distance traveled here, would be the integral of t sub 1 to t sub 2 absolute value of velocity dt, just making everything positive. So those are the two generic formulas to remember. Hope that makes some sense. Try to visualize it, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow in class.